Hello students, uh, today we'll be doing the current affairs again. Uh, the first topic uh, for the day would be fair and remunerative pricing. This is a very important topic. You can actually expect a question from uh, this particular topic for UPSC prelims uh, uh, because MSP is a favorite topic of UPSC always. Please read more about MSP. Over here we will uh, discuss about fair and remunerative pricing which is a form of MSP for sugarcane while MSP is the term that is used for the other crops like say rice, like say uh, wheat, groundnut. Moving on, Central Vista project, not so important topic again, but uh, please read the static part of it. Then non-fungible to non -fungible tokens, this is an extremely important uh, topic, especially because uh, blockchain, cryptocurrency has been uh, one of the important topics for UPSC. This becomes really important. Then uh, the other topics are pretty uh, static in themselves. Now, moving on. Uh, the reason why FRP is in news is because the Maharashtra government has issued a government resolution which will allow sugar mills to pay basic fair and remunerative price in two tranches, not in one, but rather two tranches. Farmers prefer that it gets paid as a lump sum in one tranche because only with the money that they get from sugar mill owners can they spend money on inputs for the next season. Usually once the sugar is harvested, after that whatever is the lump sum they get, that is what is used in order to buy the fertilizers, pesticides, seeds for the next season. Now, how is this FRP itself decided? The FRP, fair and remunerative price, is based on recovery of sugar from the sugar cane. Now, on the basis of how much sugar can be recovered from the sugar cane, that decides what the FRP would be. Now, uh, for example, for the sugar season of 2021-22, the FRP has been fi fixed at 2,900 rupees per ton at a base recovery of 10%. Now, this 10% means that around 10% sugar is recovered from the entire sugar cane. Because of prior planning and prior testing, it is believed that only 10% of the sugar cane can actually be harvested out of the entire weight of the sugar cane. And hence, the FRP is based on this amount of sucrose content. Okay. Now, sugar recovery is nothing but the ratio between the sugar produced versus the cane crushed expressed as a percentage. The amount of sugar divided by the weight of cane. Weight of the cane. Now, what is uh, like how the MSP is announced by the uh, economic, affair, uh, economic Affairs Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs. Uh, similarly, the fair and remunerative price is also announced by the Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs. The central government announces the fair and remunerative prices which are determined on the recommendations of the Commission for Agricultural Costs and Prices. So this is the commission that recommends to the Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs and the Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs is what that announces. So finally, if there is a question in the prelims which says the FRP is announced is announced by CA 
C P you will mark the statement as wrong why because the FRP is announced rather by cabinet committee on economic affairs and not by the CACP okay now why are the farmers in Maharashtra protesting the farmers argue that this method of uh, paying them off in two different tranches is going to impact their income now they point out that while FRP will be paid in installments the bank loans and other expenses are expected to be paid for as usual now if the farmers are not getting the entire money how will they end up paying the loans that they have taken and the installments on the uh, mechanical instruments that they borrowed also farmers mostly require a lump sum at the beginning of the season between October and November which is the Rabi season because the next uh, crop cycle depends on it now sugar cane what is sugar cane now sugar cane is a it's a very water intensive crop now what are the other features of sugar cane so water intensive crop also please do definitely read more about uh, what are the different types of sugar cane you know you have uh, ek sali you have ad sali ek sali is something that is grown for one year ad sali is something that is grown for one and a half years sugar cane actually it has a very long growing season uh, it is continuously grown for one year while the other crops are usually grown for three months at the max and they're harvested after that so since uh, sugar cane is grown continuously for so many months what it does is it takes away the nutrients there's a nutrient loss in the case of sugar cane and hence these particular the same kinds of nutrients are removed uh, when sugar cane is grown on that particular farm and hence these particular farms are actually supplied with additional nutrition in order to help them survive or in order to recuperate these particular soils hence okay no sugar cane also the other conditions uh, that sugar cane has is that sugar cane uh, does not prefer standing water or stagnant water and hence this should be avoided okay uh, then beyond this uh, sugar cane takes a lot of labor and uh, it takes a lot of water no it the temperature that it needs is normally tropical temperature that is why brazil is the highest producer of sugar cane and then after that you have india and then mexico and then so on indonesia okay uh, colder uh, climates are not su- suitable for the growth of sugar cane now rainfall is between 75 to 100 cm soil type has to be deep rich loamy soils now the top sugar cane producing states in india are uttar pradesh and then followed by maharashtra karnataka tamil nadu and then bihar Uttar Pradesh became the largest producer after the introduction of this variety known as Coimbatore 0632 um, this is the number i believe please just check uh, it is a hybrid variety which was introduced in Uttar Pradesh and then after this uh, was introduced the crop out- output of uh, Uttar Pradesh has increased in order to go past maharashtra uh, historically maharashtra has had a very good output of sugar cane why because of the cooperative culture in maharashtra maharashtra has a very good cooperative culture now cooperative culture is important in the growth of sugar cane because uh, this particular boiler which is used in order to extract sugar sugar from sugar cane 
it takes a lot of uh, fuel in order to switch on and switch off so if there is a group of people who are supplying the sugar cane then there is no need to keep switching on and switching off that particular boiler and that conserves an energy and increases profits and that is the reason why it is there uh, it is there in maharashtra now also please remember that you know references to sugar were made even in atharva veda one of the four foundational vedas okay uh, next uh in india there was this commission which is known as the rangarajan commission commission which was set up in order to uh, deal with the problems in sugar industry so this particular rangarajan commission removed all the additional burdens that existed such as uh, it diluted the cane reservation area it diluted uh, the mandatory uh, selling of uh, sugar uh, the minimum levy price was improved and then uh, you know some other changes that were made please go into the changes that were uh, made by this rangarajan commission the recommendations basically they sought to deregulate the sugar industry also uh one more important thing is uh, sugar cane sugar is a hygroscopic element now sugar is a hygroscopic element however in india and this hygroscopic uh, elements cannot be packed into jute because it will result in contamination of that uh, quantity or it will result in wastage however in india most of the sugar is packed in jute bags and that is a big problem uh some of the other reasons why uh, maharashtra or the south indian states are better off as compared to north india is because of the longer crushing season long crushing season because i told you that uh, sugar cane needs warm climate and you see that in south india there is a longer tenure of warm frost free climate uh okay and uh, also the industries or the mills in south india are equipped with uh, newer technology hmm. next okay next uh, we shall move on uh this rangarajan commission also actually banned this concept of state advised prices as states were also announcing prices along with this fair and remunerative price in order to cater to their vote bank hence in order to prevent this rangarajan commission said that states cannot announce this state advised prices which was announced just before elections and uh, it didn't make any sense now uh, moving on central vista project central vista project was actually envisioned in order to uh showcase the might of new india because the earlier parliament that existed or the earlier lutians delegates that existed it was constructed way back in the years 1930 and 1940s it's been more than about 70 80 years since it was constructed and hence most of these buildings have actually lost their past glory and they are falling apart hence it was decided to revive the uh, glory of the indian parliament by constructing a new parliament and also uh, you know that the rajya sabha accumulate it have holds around 230 members while the lok sabha has about 550 members these numbers are actually not being able to be fit inside the parliament building that we have currently and this is also prohibiting the expansion of these uh, chambers uh, also the current parliament it has problems with related to leaking uh, 
leaking walls it has problems with related to old and obsolete technology like lack of uh, microphones uh, lack of cushioning uh, then uh, resounding effects so in order to prevent all of this the government has gone for the central vista project now union ministries that have offices in shram shakti bhavan and transport bhavan were asked by the housing and urban affairs ministry to shift out of these buildings which are also proposed to be demolished as a part of the central vista project both the shram shakti bhavan and the transport bhavan they are being demolished now what does this entire project envisage construction of triangular parliament building which we spoke about constructing common central secretariat from the one that exists currently revamping the 3 km long rajpath from rashtrapati bhavan to india gate see there is this long road which exists from rashtrapati bhavan to india gate now uh, in order to they are also planning on revamping this particular route in order to increase the amenities over here also north and south block which house the ministry of external affairs ministry of finance uh ministry of home and ministry of defense these particular ministries are held in the north and south block so these buildings are are uh, being shifted out and uh, the north and south blocks are being converted into museums currently okay now uh the current parliament which is the circular parliament which represents even last year there was a question in the prelims which uh, asked about shavasat yogini temple and uh, said that it was a representation of the current parliament so please read all these things the current parliament is going to be constructed as a museum converted as a museum also uh, there will be construction of new homes of the prime minister and the president uh, vice president over there itself within the central vista lane currently uh, the prime minister says stays at seven race course lane and the vice president uh, also stays in a very uh, different place now what are the features of this new parliament it will be three times bigger than the existing 93 year old heritage building we spoke about the reasons why it will be constructed in such a big manner it is likely to have a triangular shape with a built up area of 65000 square meters and is scheduled to be completed in 2022 correctly in time for the 75th independence day celebrations and the g20 summit now the india is seen as the g20 chair for the year 2022 23 uh, the present parliament building is 85 years old and suffers from inadequacy of space to house members and their staff parliament house building was designed by both uh, herbert baker and edward lutyens and uh, the, they were the architects who ended up constructing most of the current part of delhi which is known as new delhi also this entire project is being built at a cost of around 1400 crores which is a huge amount of money hence there are debates on if it's necessary or not just like the there existed the same debate about the statue of peace i mean statue of unity i'm sorry okay uh i am sure uh, you all know that the idea to shift the capital from uh, calcutta to delhi was taken during the delhi darbar in 1911 when king george v made an announcement now uh also please know that uh, the rashtrapati bhavan was designed by edwin lutyens while the secretariat which this particular secretariat which includes both the north and the south blocks in the rashtrapati bhavan was designed by herbert baker while the rashtrapati bhavan was designed by edwin lutyens the secretariat was designed by herbert baker please remember that rashtrapati bhavan by 
Mr. Lutians and uh, Secretariat by Mr. Baker, Herbert Baker from South Africa. Okay. The new parliament building will have high quality acoustics and audio visual facilities, improved and comfortable seating arrangements, effective and inclusive emergency provisions with high level security for the members. Now, moving on, the most important topic, non-fungible tokens. What are non-fungible tokens? Non-fungible tokens are gaining massive popularity now. Why are they in the news? Okay. Non-fungible tokens are things which are distinct and they cannot be more than one in number. Not more than one in number. Now, NFTs are gaining massive popularity now because they are becoming an increasingly popular way to showcase and sell one's digital work. Let it be paintings. Let it be music or let it be anything, stamps, anything. What are NFTs? NFTs are a unique, irreplaceable token that can be used to prove ownership of digital assets such as music, artwork, even tweets and memes. Like say for example, uh, Jack Dorsey who was the CEO, earlier CEO of Twitter, he ended up selling his first tweet as an NFT. Now it is a unique uh, thing which is bid and bought and it is held by people like it's a, it's a painting or it's a digital work which can be maintained by people and no one can replicate it. It is only one in number. Uh, now, anything that can be converted into a digital form can be an NFT. Everything from drawings, photos, videos, GIF, music, uh, game items, selfies and even a tweet can be turned into an NFT which can then be traded online using cryptocurrency or even normal currency it doesn't necessarily have to be crypto cryptocurrency. What makes NFTs unique from other digital forms? Okay, now these particular NFTs, if I have a digital form, if I have a photo, it can be replicated. Many people can claim ownership. However, NFTs are backed by blockchain technology, which means that every NFT has uh, the transaction surrounding NFTs need to be approved by all the users who will be approving that particular block. Remember uh, how blockchain technology works, you have separate blocks and each block has a hash which is connected to the previous block and in order to approve a transactions, in order to approve a transaction, several users of that particular blockchain technology, decentralized technology have to approve the transaction. Similarly, NFTs are backed by blockchain technology. NFT transactions are recorded on blockchains which is a digital public ledger with most NFTs being part of the ethereum blockchain this is one of the blockchains like how you have the bitcoin blockchain or you have the cardano blockchain you have several blockchains while nfts normally use uh, ethereum blockchain majorly now what is the difference between it, uh, nft and cryptocurrency nfts the name itself is there it says it is non fungible which means that one NFT's value is not equivalent to other NFT's value. Like say for example, one painting can be highly expensive and the other painting which is converted into NFT need not be as expensive. It depends upon who the creator is, what is the effort that has gone into it, what is the demand that exists for that painting. Okay. Now while uh, Bitcoins or say Ether, all of them are actually worth the same amount of price. Cryptocurrency is a currency and is fungible, meaning that it is interchangeable. For instance, if you hold one crypto token, say one Ethereum, the next Ethereum that you will hold will also be of the same value. So these are fungible currencies. It is, it's a currency 
and it is fungible in nature which means that all of them will be the same value all of them will be alike and there will be no difference and it can be interchanged from one person to another person whereas uh, nfts are non fungible they are not the same they cannot be interchanged they have to be bought and sold uh, each one is unique has a different value okay now now what are the risks associated with buying nfts in the recent past several incidents of nft scams have been reported including emergence of fake marketplaces unverified sellers often impersonating real artists and selling copies of their artworks for half the prices so we have to know who is the seller and what are the mediums that they are using for selling proper verification has to be done because any person on the online can imitate any other person and try to sell off some piece of art uh, which is much less in value now uh please uh, see this is not nfrs this would be nfts now also please remember that because nfts majorly are traded using cryptocurrency uh there is a lot of heat that gets generated why cryptocurrency mining it requires a lot of uh, computational power a lot of transactions have to be approved and only then cryptocurrency can be mined hence uh, this uh, uh please remember that uh, nfts have a negative impact on the environment in order to validate transactions crypto mining is done which requires high powered computers that run at a very high capacity affecting environment they run at a high capacity they release a lot of uh, heat in the process and that affects them uh, that affects the environment now moving on uh the nasa nasa's lucy mission uh nasa has uh, please uh, know what this lucy mission is about uh Lucy mission has this uh, idea of actually visiting several asteroids which are uh which are uh, in Jupiter's uh, belt okay uh, all the asteroids which are surrounding Jupiter's uh, belt these are the ones which are explored by the Lucy mission of NASA this is the main goal in order to understand uh, conditions over there life over there in order to understand the origin of the universe now uribates is one of them one of these trojan asteroids now uribates is one of a handful of asteroids that lucy mission will visit over the next 12 years recently astronomers at las vegas were observing a star which appeared to briefly blink out because the asteroid uribates had passed in front of it you know because there is a star and because this particular asteroid called uribates moved in front of that star it ended up casting a shadow on this star itself and this phenomenon is known as occultation okay and that is the reason why the star could not be seen uh what is this uh, nasa's lucy mission it is nasa's first mission to explore jupiter's trojan asteroids like what we spoke of it is a solar powered mission it is completely supported by solar energy it is estimated to be covered over 12 years during which the spacecraft will visit eight asteroids covering a distance of about 6.3 billion kilometers to deepen the understanding of the young solar system our solar system is one of the youngest systems out there and hence uh, uh this huge distance and over a period of 12 years this lucy mission would cover all these asteroids the mission is designed to understand the composition of the diverse asteroids that are part of the trojan asteroid swarms to determine the mass and densities of the materials and to look for and study the satellites and rings that may orbit the trojan asteroids what are these trojan asteroids and their compositions now moving on next topic
लचित बोरफुकान Earlier this week the chief minister of Assam had announced a number of projects in connection with the 400th birth anniversary of Lachit Borfukan. Now along with the Alaboy War Memorial at Dadara a Lachit Samadhi would also be built. These are the two things that are planned to be built. on the 400th birth anniversary of lachit borfukan who was lachit borfukan he was one of the generals of the ahoms and the idea with uh, installing a war memorial for him is that we are trying to revive the pride of these heroes who have not been cherished enough in our history okay he was a commander in the ahom kingdom he was known for his leadership of the 1671 battle of sarai ghati that thwarted a campaign by the mughal forces to take over the ahom kingdom in fact on this particular ba- during this particular battle when the ahom forces were actually losing <coughs> it was lachit borfukan who gave a passionate speech to the forces of the ahom army in order to turn them around and in order to defeat the mughals who were advancing uh the battle of the sarai ghati was actually fought on the banks of um the river brahmaputra in gohati also please know that uh, the national defense academy has been conferring the best passing out ca- cadet with the lachit borfukan gold medal for bravery okay <clears throat> i'm sorry now okay uh, so in fact the mughal forces who were led by mr ram singh one uh, they consisted of much higher numbers as compared to the ahom kingdom and because of this particular victory uh, the mughal forces were forced to retreat from gauhati now this national defense academy is nothing but it's the defense service training institute of the indian armed forces where all the three services indian army indian navy and indian air force train together before they go on respective service academy the nda is actually located in pune and it is one of the first tri service academies in the world it is a tri service academy it is in pune and people train over here before actually joining to the uh their respective uh, uh services now moving on who were the ahoms ahoms were the rulers of the northeast majorly assam they created a new state by suppressing the older political system of the landlords called bhuyans the ahom state depended upon forced labor and the people who were working for the state this was a very common thing it existed even under the guptas and these people were actually known as pikes under the ahoms okay uh then uh a home society was divided into clans or kels uh these clans always exist in every society a kel is often control often control several villages and a homes worship their own tribal gods yet they accepted hindu religion and assamese language it was a combination of both however these a home kings they did not completely give up their traditional beliefs what are these traditional beliefs worship of nature worship of the sun you know wind and all of that now poets and scholars were also given land grants and theater was encouraged under the homes now historical works known as buranjis were also written first in the home language and later in assam assamese please remember all these things if someone asks you in the prelims if uh, the upsc asks you in the prelims what were buranjis they were nothing but historical 
works of Ahom's. Now, moving on. Also, uh, the Ahom kingdom actually started off in the 13th century AD uh, by a person known as uh, Chaolung Sukhapa. Okay. No. They okay. Okay. Now moving on. Uh, moving on to the next uh, topic. From the 13th century. Uh, remember the timeline. 13th century AD. Uh, Narsing Mehta. Who is Narsin Mehta? He was actually a literary person, uh, literature. And he wrote a lot of liter literary works, a lot of bhajans, which became popular even during his times and later on also. Uh, recently, a spider species was named after Mr. Narsin Mehta. He is believed to have been born in Thalaja in present-day Bhavnagar of Gujarat and died later in Gujarat itself in Junagadh. Now, uh, the family members were known as Mehtas and they kept books of accounts like the Kayasts. Now, Mr. Uh, Narsin Mehta used to spend time in Krishna Bhakti. He was a devotee of Lord Krishna and uh, he was also one of the Bhakti saints who focused on love and devotion towards God rather than rituals and sacrifices. Mm. Uh, Mr. Mehta used to be submerged in Krishna Bhakti, writing and singing bhajans. They were known as Kirtans. Okay. Uh, Narsin Mehta penned more than 750 poems known as Pad in Gujarati. They mainly deal with devotion to Lord Krishna. Works like Shalmshano Viva, uh, Kunvar Bhainu Mameru. Undi and Harmala are believed to be autobiographical accounts of different occasions in his life. Of his life itself, in different phases, whatever he felt, he had made uh, written accounts of written accounts with these particular names. Vaishnava Jan To Thene Kahiye Mahatma Gandhi's favorite bhajan is also Mah uh, Narsin Mehta's creation. And hence, uh, he had a great influence on the father of the nation as well. Thank you.